On behalf of the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, we thank you for attending today's presentation, Postpartum Return to Physical Activity, with Dr. Lisa Woodruff, Becca Mellon, Clinical Sports Dietitian, and Natalie Cruz, uh, one of our physical therapists. Our faculty's goal is to share information you can use about the latest therapies and techniques in medicine and answer your questions about how to partner with us in the care of your patients. These are informational presentations to enhance your clinical practices and to provide you with the most updated information we have. No CME credit is provided at this time. This program is being recorded and will be posted to our educational resources for referring physicians webpage. We encourage questions throughout the program with the chat function and or you can unmute yourself to interact directly with any of our presenters. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lisa Woodruff um, to introduce herself and her team and then we will get going with the presentation. Thank you, yes, I'm Lisa Woodruff. I am a pediatrician by training um, or by background, also uh, did fellowship and work in sports medicine here at the University of Iowa, actively um, developing, my big role here is developing uh, our female athlete program component to our sports medicine program at large. Um, and so this is a um, area, postpartum return to activity is a area that both academically and clinically, I think um, there's a big need for and something that I've taken a lot of interest in. And so um, kind of have formed this team along with Natalie and Becca and several others, uh, how to best care for patients sort of in this time of their lives. And um, we'll touch on kind of how we go about this now and certainly there um, you will see as we go through the program there are a lot of holes in evidence um, guiding us in this particular area and so we'll hopefully um, make mention of that a lot of this is more um, experience based than it is per se evidence based um, again which makes it a big academic interest of mine too to try to fill some of those holes so we'll get started and like she said please um, Please interrupt if you have any questions. I'm sort of going to run through this about it, as how I would uh, approach a patient um, that would come into clinic and we'll kind of pass it off to uh, Becca and Natalie when we get to their respective specialties as well. So um, just kind of touching base on what this is that we're doing here. Um, just to note that we are forming here comprehensive model caring for physically active females across the age spectrum and so caring for multiple kind of patients at multiple times in their lives and this like i said pregnancy and postpartum activity is one that um, i do feel like there's a significant need for and so something that we're really trying to tailor our practice towards um, just a brief touch on um, exercise in pregnancy specifically. Um, I know we're going to focus mostly on the postpartum period, but, and I am in no way meaning to claim myself as an obstetrician or gynecologist, um, just trying to make mention of how sports medicine fits into this realm. So brief mention of exercise related to actual pregnancy, ACOG stances here, um, essentially that uh, exercise is recommended for all pregnant women in the absence of other medical or obstetric complications. And uh, those of you who are obstetricians certainly know this uh, much better than I do, but just a quick reminder here of absolute uh, contraindications to exercise in pregnancy listed here. Um, and then activities that we do feel are safe activities in pregnancy as well. Um, included, you can see here, there's quite the spectrum of um, intensity and also a level of impact. And level of impact is certainly something that um, we'll talk a little bit more about here as we go through the presentation. But as you can see, anything from light yoga to running and more strength training, um, anaerobic type activity, they're all uh, considered safe 
those that are considered not safe in pregnancy um, for various reasons are listed here. Uh, hot yoga being considered something to avoid in the first trimester due to the temperature. Um, and then contact sports, obviously in sports that are higher risk for falling or sustaining an injury that way. And then scuba diving and skydiving. So moving quickly to kind of the meat of the matter here with postpartum return to activity. Um, I want to start again by saying there is very, very, very little evidence in this area. Um, I feel that the most common recommendations given to the lay population are, it falls into this box of ask your doctor. Um, but really, I feel like as physicians, we don't have a lot of guidance as when they do ask us. And so what we know is that so far, kind of right now, they're, you know, people are seeing their, over at their six week postpartum check and uh, that's sort of when physical activity clearance is determined. And then from there, they're sort of released to the wild. Um, we know that there are various time points where things can come up outside of that six week time mark as well. And um, of note, there are case reports of elite athletes, again, elite athletes returning maybe more quickly than that and safely. Uh, this picture is a picture of Kara Goucher, one of the well-known um, elite runners in the United States who has a well-known documented story throughout her kind of pregnancy journey and postpartum journey uh, where she was competing at a pretty high level shortly after um, delivering. So uh, these are case reports. Again, we have really not a lot of evidence to guide what people should be doing at various levels of uh, intensity or activity. So what we do know is that approaching these patients should be done right now in a very individualized way. So it's, this is part of the reason why there is such little literature because there are so many variables when it comes to a postpartum patient's journey. There are so many things that go into and can happen with both pregnancy and delivery um, and then various things that, that come up after that, whether or not they're breastfeeding, how sleep is going, how their nutrition is, um, what their overall strength uh, and conditioning status is, uh, what's the status of their pelvic floor, what's the status of their mental health and their support system and their ability or their need or, or want to even participate in some of these things. So there are a lot of factors to consider uh, when talking to these patients. It's certainly not just a, you know, here's your blank check, you're cleared to start running or start crossfitting and, and away you go. I think we really have to drill down into some of these other factors, which is why we sort of are incorporating uh, team members the way that we are before they even um, come to me, hopefully, with uh, a plan to return to activity. But these are things that we need to look at. The other big picture thing that I think we would like to keep in mind um, in, going along with the individualized approach is making this sort of a criterion based sit, uh, return rather than strictly time based. I think time making a return plan for patients that is time based alone is sort of again takes away from the individualized effort and puts everybody kind of into the same box. And so I really think that we um, can work to develop and we are working to develop more of a, you know, of a functional assessment that walks people through all of these factors and things that need to be in line to be ready to return. Um, and that is much more important, I feel, than whether or not they've hit a specific timeline and then could be considered safe or unsafe to return. Uh, and again, this should be a, a multidisciplinary approach. Um, so including uh, nutrition evaluation, obviously including um, the OBs on the team, public floor physical therapy, other physical therapists as well, the sports medicine side, and then as well, um, lactation specialists if patients are breastfeeding. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over as, again, kind of trying to shape this as how I would approach a patient in clinic. A patient comes to me, one of the biggest things that, like I just said, we need to evaluate and make sure we are um, okay with is their postpartum nutrition. And so here is where I will hand it over to Becca to sort of talk on um, things from her perspective. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Can everybody hear me? Are we good? Perfect. All right. All right. Wonderful. So I work with women of all ages. I work with women who are young athletes, women who are pregnant, women who are in the postpartum period. And I think younger in life, we get a lot of guidance as to our nutritional needs. Uh, the requirements for pregnancy have been well studied, well documented. We know what nutrients we need to grow a safe, healthy pregnancy. Um, but like Lisa was mentioning, there's very little research when it comes to the post, po postpartum period. It's uh, kind of you're thrown out on your own. And in terms of nutrition, postpartum wellness is generally seen as weight loss, you know, losing that baby weight, getting back to your pre-baby body. But it's so much more than that. And when we pursue the weight loss without taking into account the nutrition and the specific foods we're eating and why we're eating them, um, we can really get ourselves in a tough situation that puts our health and our athletic performance, if that's something we want to pursue, it puts it at risk. Um, so the major components of postpartum nutrition are going to be getting enough calories to help our bodies recover from what they've just been through, you know, the entire process of growing and having a child, um, in addition to returning to sport if we choose. So under fueling, not getting enough calories to meet your needs can lead to increased risk of injuries, illness, and fatigue. And it's important to really focus on the positives of nutrition, getting all of the nourishment we need, rather than what we can cut out and cut back on in order to meet society's definition of postpartum wellness. So as you can imagine, calorie needs are gonna be higher, especially if you're breastfeeding or if you are returning to exercise. Um, the calorie cost of breastfeeding is up to 500 calories a day. So that's pretty significant if you think about the average calorie requirements for a woman of childbearing age would be in the, you know, 2000, 2200 range. That's almost a quarter of that. So this generally will come from fat stores, but it also will come from increased food intake. Our body gives us kind of that drive to consume a little bit more. Um, in theory, a woman who is not breastfeeding, her calorie needs will return to baseline. But again, your body is trying to heal from the childbirth process. You've got ligaments, you've got muscles that need to be strengthened, that need to be rebuilt, and you're going to need a little bit of extra energy to support that process. Um, in addition, if you are getting back into exercise and activity, we do want to add on a little bit of calorie intake to cover that as well. You can switch the slide. Perfect. All right. So all of our calories are gonna be broken down into carbs, protein, and fat. There's a lot to look at here, but what I want you guys to take away is that you're gonna need a combination of all three macronutrients to be as healthy as possible when returning to activity after pregnancy. Um, carbohydrates are the preferred source of energy for our brains and muscles. So when we don't have them, we can have fatigue, we can be hangry, the hangry mom is not a fun feeling. We don't want to experience that. So we want to make sure that we are incorporating those carbs regardless of their, um, their viewpoint in society. So I would say that we want to get those simple, easily digestible carbohydrates before and after exercise. It's really going to give your muscles that fuel they need. We want to choose things that digest quickly to reduce any stomach discomfort, especially because your body may be kind of getting back into the process of digesting food and using it for fuel and exercise. So just quick, simple things like fruit, fruit juice, uh, carbohydrate options like pretzels and rice cakes, they're gonna be great. Throughout the day, 
we still want to be consuming those carbs. They're not just for exercise. So we want to choose those slow digesting carbohydrates throughout the day. Those are going to keep us full and focused, getting our brain the adequate fuel to do all the things that new moms need to do. Um, so things like brown rice, sweet potatoes, bread, pasta, cereal, oatmeal, those are all going to be good choices to keep a postpartum woman athlete feeling, feeling at her best throughout the day. So protein is going to be crucial for rebuilding. Um, when we're building that strength back up, we need to have the amino acid building blocks to facilitate that. So when we don't get quite enough protein, we can recover more slowly, both from the pregnancy and from exercise. We're also at a greater risk of injury and illness. So those are the last things that we want when we're trying to return to a sense of normalcy, if you will. So the best way to spread that protein intake is going to be throughout the day. That'll help us really utilize it most efficiently, um, especially in the post-workout meal or snack. It's going to be really uh, available to the body to really optimize that mus muscle protein synthesis. So you guys can just see the examples down there. Of course, you know, we've got our meat and our dairy, but we've also got some plant-based options too. And then those healthy fats are gonna be essential for hormone production and health. They also help us absorb some really important vitamins in the body. Um, gone are the days of the low fat diet. We wanna make sure we're getting enough of this important nutrient. It's also more calorie dense. So if you happen to feel like you're always eating in this postpartum period, you just can't, can't stop snacking throughout the day, fat is going to help you meet those nutrient needs and get those calories in without uh, the volume. So a patient who may be on the go and struggling to get enough in, increasing those fats can be helpful. Okay, we can go ahead and switch. Perfect. And then I just want to run through some of the micronutrients. Of course, uh, we really emphasize getting the appropriate micronutrients before during the pregnancy period to support fetal development, everything like that. Um, but the recommendations really drop off in the literature after, after the baby has been born. Um, we're kind of left wondering what we need. So folic acid is, of course, important during pregnancy, but we also need to take it into consideration after pregnancy. Um, of course, the consequences of megaloblastic anemia, like fatigue, are going to be amplified in someone who is not only trying to be a new mom, but trying to return to physical activity. So as a dietitian, I recommend continuing the folic acid supplementation, at least through the breastfeeding period uh, or newly after pregnancy, or consumption of fortified foods. So that would be like breakfast cereals, um, fortified grains like pasta and bread, those are going to have a good dose of folic acid, but supplementation is generally, generally good in that circumstance. Okay. So of course for iron, um, we can have that bleeding for six to eight weeks after pregnancy. So that's going to sustain the increased iron needs. And then of course, when we return to our menstrual cycle, um, we'll need that increased iron as well. So for a woman who is supplementing iron during pregnancy, um, incorporating that supplementation in the postpartum period is generally helpful. Of course, it's always good to get those iron levels checked to make sure that you are not over supplementing with iron, but the 25 to 30 milligrams per day that's required during pregnancy is still going to be beneficial afterwards. And this can come from incorporating iron rich foods, but these elevated needs can be pretty challenging for patients to meet just from food sources, especially if they are not big red meat eaters. Um, Plant-based iron sources are pretty t uh, difficult to absorb. We can increase absorption by pairing with vitamin C or decrease, or, um, and absorption would also decrease if they're taking a calcium supplement. So we just kind of want to ask them what other supplements they're taking. Um, calcium needs aren't going to be increased during pregnancy, but female athletes always do have higher calcium needs than the general population. Um, it's just essential for maintaining the, that bone health. So I always encourage patients to incorporate calcium rich foods three to five times per day. Um, and if this isn't possible in their diet, 
it's always, uh, we can always take a supplement for that as well. And vitamin D, of course, um, needed during pregnancy to support the bone growth of the fetus. But afterwards, you know, we're living in Iowa, we don't see the sun half the year. And with the duration of pregnancy being nine months, you're probably going to have a uh, low vitamin D from the sun at some point during that period. So for most people, a vitamin D supplement is going to be beneficial. Of course, getting those levels checked is a great prerequisite for that, but very few food sources contain vitamin D. So the supplemental option is usually the way to go. I think I've got one more here. Yes, omega-3. So we are still learning about omega-3's roles in the body during pregnancy and just in general but it is going to reduce inflammation and support recovery for female athletes who are returning to activity. It's also very important for cognition, brain and heart health just in general. So there has been some evidence to, su to suggest a role in postpartum depression. Obviously we have a lot of research to do before we can recommend it, but since it is difficult to obtain from the diet, we, an omega-3 supplement can be beneficial in the postpartum period. Okay, so just a couple practical tips to leave you guys with if you are uh, giving some nutrition advice to patients. Um, again, sometimes patients can feel like they're always eating or they just can't get enough food in during the day. So for that, I usually suggest calorie-dense snacks that incorporate a protein and a carbohydrate. Um, helps the, with muscle repair, helps you feel less hangry and more happy because we've got that mental energy and, you know, incorporating the fat's going to help meet those calorie needs. Um, I know that typical diet advice would suggest the opposite of what's li listed here, but we really want to get the most nutrition bang for our buck, as I like to say. So if you're choosing full fat instead of fat-free dairy products, if you're choosing you know, a thicker bagel instead of thin, spli thin sliced bread, you're going to be getting more calorie bang for your buck, more nutrition to help you meet those calorie needs. But, you know, you don't necessarily have to worry about consuming a larger volume of food. Okay. And then when it comes to exercising in this postpartum period, we want to make sure that we are providing ourselves the necessary fuel so that instead of digging ourselves a nutritional hole when we go and do this activity, we are supporting it with the right nutrients. Um, you know, you're not going to take your car out for a drive without putting gas in it first. So before exercise, I always recommend a quick carbohydrate-based snack that's going to fit easily into your patient's day. So whether they're, you know, grabbing a squeezy applesauce after work on their way to the gym, something like that. It's going to help them feel better during exercise and it's going to help them recover more quickly so they can get back into that exercise routine that they are accustomed to. Um, after exercise, getting a snack with carbohydrate and protein is going to be crucial for jumpstarting that recovery. I have some recommendations on the slide just for amounts. It is highly individual based on the patient, but I really recommend packing, you know, having the patient pack something convenient so that we can start that muscle recovery process so we can replenish those glycogen stores. And ultimately, it'll help them feel better as they continue their progression back into exercise. Okay. And here's just a couple practical tips for your patients. I know that a lot of new moms are busy and overwhelmed and nutrition can seem extremely challenging during this time. So just some recommendations I usually use would be batch cooking and freezing meals, um, making large batches of proteins and grains and kind of combining them with convenient ingredients like sauces and frozen veggies. And then making energy dense filling snacks. So instead of, you know, maybe going with the celery and rice cakes, choosing something a little bit more hearty, like a trail mix or a protein bar that's going to keep you full and you don't have to worry about fueling quite as often. Um, of course, I also recommend just keeping snacks everywhere, your office drawer, your gym bag, um, making fuel available so we can keep our bodies in that muscle building mode rather than break down. Um, I, always, I also recommend, you know, engaging that support system and letting 
you know, whether it's your patient's partner or others in the family, just kind of getting them involved with nutrition. And then of course, incorporating their favorite foods to keep nutrition fun, because at the end of the day, eating shouldn't be a chore. And we want to make sure we're getting that fuel, but we want to make sure that we're doing it in a sustainable way that we enjoy. So that's what I've got for you. Perfect. Thank you, Becca. So next, um, moving on to um, kind of an assessment, uh, another realm of assessment here with our pelvic floor physical therapy colleague, Natalie. Natalie, can, can you, you hear me? I can. Do you have control or do you want me to keep flipping slides? Um, I'll have you um, do the slides for me. And I apologize, my speaker wasn't working before I had met a different computer at work. <laughs> okay, no problem. So, all right. Well, I'm Natalie. I'm a pelvic physical therapist as well as lymphedema at University of Iowa. And I wanted to just say, you know, what does a pelvic PT do? Most people are quite familiar with uh, what a uh, orthopedic or a neurologic, a, a neuro, neurology, excuse me, based uh, physical therapist does. So a pelvic PT can assist with any of these disorders that are listed below. Um, and the urinary disorders can include, can include leakage, hesitancy, incomplete emptying, pain with urination, frequency, urgency, bed wetting uh, with bowel disorders that can include constipation, leakage, any kind of difficulty emptying or um, uh, frequency or urgency. As far as pain, uh, there can be pain with intercourse, whether it's more deep or superficial. So we can assess uh, where that pain can be coming from. Um, some other disorders that people may have had prior to pregnancy and delivery can be more like vulvodynia or vaginismus. Uh, so we can also help with the post-operative care that being if they've had a cesarean section or any kind of repair of their perineal tears. And then also with the DRA, um, any kind of separation of their abdominal muscles that may have happened during pregnancy that can persist following the uh, delivery as well, um, working on strengthening to help with that, as well as any sort of musculoskeletal disorders that can occur because there's a lot of change in your posture and there may be some repetitive lifting that occurs with infants and possible uh, small children around the home. Um, and then any kind of continued hormone fluctuations that might be occurring that can change um, some of that composition as well. Uh, not relating to this presentation, but pelvic PTs can also assist if there's any kind of male issues, oncology, pediatric, uh, endometriosis, menopause issues, um, so things that can come up later that uh, may assist following postpartum. So next slide. And then as far as experience, what you want to look for if you're looking for a uh, pelvic floor PT or anyone that you're wanting to have take additional training, you want to see that they have taken courses on the pelvic floor and um, surrounding peripartum issues. Uh, that maybe they have a certification or a clinical specialty. Um, all the PTs at University of Iowa have taken courses and are either certified or any kind of uh, clinical specialty and definitely have a lot of experience with the patients that we are referred. So when do you refer the patient? You're thinking you've got someone who has one of those issues and you would like them to be seen by a pelvic PT. Uh, so we can actually go up to the floor and see people uh, while they're still in the hospital if there's any kind of issue with uh, gait or functional mobility following their delivery. Um, and then any kind of pain that you think would um, uh, make it hard for them to go home and, and care for themselves even. So typically we are referred the patients after their six week follow-up appointment. Um, you know, that's typically when they'll start mentioning that some aches and pains and other issues haven't resolved following their delivery. It's typically when that tissue healing can happen and, and they're cleared to go back to some sort of uh, exercise or intercourse 
Um, so we typically see them after they're given an order after that. We can see before as long as they're cleared by the physician and there's a specific reason they're wanting them to come. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll screen for dysfunction with all of their systems that were mentioned before because the patient sometimes doesn't mention everything that they're noticing is happening because they will feel that it is quote unquote normal uh, and that it's not necessarily something a pelvic PT can help with. So as far as what we want the patient to work on, um, for goals, I want to see that they don't have very much pain or minimal pain. Um, sometimes they do have pain prior to uh, delivering. So getting back to a lower level of pain um, or just pain free in general. As far as continence, um, I always put out a PSA. It's common, but it's not normal to leak even when you're coughing and sneezing. So letting them know that we want them to be continent, to not have to rely on pads or depends anymore. Uh, as far as pain um, and returning to intercourse, uh, intercourse is supposed to be pleasurable. So there shouldn't be pain with returning to intercourse after delivery. And then a heaviness or fullness sensation, people can feel uh, like they aren't completely healed, that things are still lax in that region. So trying to make sure that they feel they have control of those muscles and aren't feeling heavy in their pelvis. And then also uh, that separation of their abdominal muscles, wanting to make sure that they have reduced that as much as they can or closed completely. As far as uh, returning to exercise, there are so many great benefits to exercise. So wanting them to be either back on a regimen or start one uh, to help feel like they're gaining that strength back. As was mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily about weight loss. We encourage um, feeling you have greater control of your body, you're feeling stronger, you're not having pain. And also we're just another, um, another provider to screen for postpartum depression and make sure that they are getting enough help and if they need any additional services that we can um, ask for a referral or have them seek out some sort of assistance with that. So as far as the assessment that we complete, again, asking all the questions about what could be going on. Are you leaking? Do you have pain? Do you have pain with this activity or this activity? And just telling them that it's not normal and that it is something that they want to uh, seek help for and, and that if we can assist with treating. Um, as far as the uh, external assessment of the lumbopelvic region, we're looking at whether they have uh, good posture, good mechanics, how stable everything looks, and how they're moving, and if they can move better. Uh, an internal assessment, we are trained on an internal vaginal assessment of the pelvic floor for uh, muscle function, so not doing any swabs or speculum use. It's more digital palpation where we uh, assess the function and uh, coordination, how your pelvic floor works with your ab abdominal muscles, uh, and then also checking your abdominal muscles for the separation of the uh, rectus abdominis. And then also looking at um, core activation and around that abdomen, if you had a C-section, are there any scars there and how's the mobility of that scar after it's healed? So with returning to activity, uh, definitely want to educate them on some postpartum changes. So there can be some weakness uh, that happens in certain muscles more than others that there's possibly a, or most likely a lack of sleep um, and your general healing of your tissue and how you might still feel heavy uh, and in your pelvis region while you're healing and also through breastfeeding that can affect it as well. Uh, and then also when assessing when someone feels mentally ready. Sometimes women will come and say they feel like they should be doing something but they've got this barrier and that barrier. So just really encouraging them that when they're ready to, to start returning to activity, 
and every body is different, we try to work on an individualized program. So if they feel that they are not ready to return, then it's not going to be a successful program. So also educating when they should um, begin activity or stop, of course, after they've been released from the physician. So um, just making sure that they're, if they did have some sort of bleeding, that they're not increasing in bleeding, um, that they're not increasing that bulging or that separation at their abdomen, um, if they feel like their scar is having too much strain on it. Um, and definitely if their body is pain, pain free or near pain free. Um, wanting to have good diet and water intake, we don't really give specifics as um, physical therapists, but just noting if someone is uh, mentioning some of those risk factors where they're really feeling fatigued and maybe not getting enough water intake because especially if they're breastfeeding, they're going to need some of those calories. Uh, and looking at sleep hygiene, that is definitely decreased. Uh, in the postpartum phase, and you want to make sure that they're getting enough sleep so they can heal and participate at their maximum potential. And we're um, having them gradually return, you know, not wanting to increase their activity too soon because then there can be a lot of issues that happen there from a musculoskeletal standpoint. We emphasize strength rather than weight loss. Again, that's a, a big thing that a lot of women will come and want to talk about weight loss. And we're rehabilitating these muscles more than focusing on toning or anything like that. So I really like to, to tell patients that they are here to focus on rehabilitating their body because um, pregnancy and delivery can be a significant event in their lives and, and their body goes through a lot of changes. So helping them to feel a little more in control of those functions. As far as treatment, uh, we prescribe exercise, but we also prescribe other manual therapy techniques or uh, body mechanics and some self-care. So as far as strengthening, we really focus on the core muscles, which does include the pelvic floor muscles. Um, looking at that scapular region too, because there can be a lot of uh, neck pain, upper shoulder and back pain that occurs with now all this lifting because babies come with a lot of equipment. Uh, and then also your hips, the SI joints, uh, and then your pubic synthesis can be an area where you can have a lot of pain too. So definitely clearing that those areas aren't still causing issues. Uh, working on scar mobilization. So that can be done internal with a perineal scar or perineal repair. Uh, and then that can affect the ability to tolerate tampon use or to tolerate intercourse. As well as the C-section scar, that can cause a lot of pain in the ab abdomen and the um, just the whole pelvic region. So making sure that moves really well once they're fairly healed there. As far as manual therapy, we can do internal manual therapy. So once we do that digital assessment and palpation of the uh, pelvic floor muscles, we can actually do manual therapy techniques where just like we would externally push, move back and forth and do different techniques to help release those tissues. Uh, also, externally, there can be some other techniques, especially if someone doesn't tolerate internal or does not consent to an internal assessment. Uh, and that's anywhere that they can have pain or restrictions. As far as body mechanics, wanting to make sure that um, everyone has good posture. There can be a change in your posture with that increased lumbar lordosis when you are pregnant. So trying to help counterbalance some of that that was happening for so long. Uh, and then also all those different functions mentioned before with carrying baby and, and car seat and everything that can come with that. We want to really avoid injury and strain. And especially if that individual is returning to work where they need to use their body a lot to work. So we also help with uh, urinary and bowel education. Uh, and that can be some self-care as far as diet, water, uh, but again, general uh, recommendations for some of that. More specifics, we would refer out for that. Uh, as far as um, posture on the toilet and making sure they're straining 
properly, um, having a good coordination of their pelvic floor muscles and their abdomen and work and when they're supposed to be and quieting when they're supposed to be, as well as just good habits in general with sleep hygiene, regular schedule, um, and taking care of themselves, focusing on some of that self-care. And then as far as sexual function, um, looking for pain and treating that pain, whether it's restrictions or muscle imbalances, uh, recommending any kind of lubricants, um, and then they can work with their physician if they have skin issues that may need some uh, prescriptions or other recommendations for that. Uh, and this all helps to increase their confidence when they are allowed to return to intercourse. And um, we can even recommend that they trial dilators first to help with stretching or to feel more confident and then be able to tolerate that uh, penetration. So as far as the timeline, uh, again, individualized. Everybody's different, has different symptoms, had a different birth story. So we want to uh, focus on what that patient's goals are and what they're trying to return to. Um, and if they had an uncomplicated delivery and pregnancies, uh, generally they can begin walking and gentle rehabilitative exercises within those first few days and recommending that they immediately start pelvic floor contractions. So then they can assist with that pelvic floor strengthening as long as it's um, pain-free. And then uh, the general recommendation has typically been exercising at six weeks because that's the, the follow-up time. That's typically when things have healed and um, patients may feel ready to return. That's something that in the research, they're looking at recommendations for returning to uh, activity or sport. Do they want to do it sooner than the six weeks? Do they want to wait even longer? So what we're seeing in the research is that uh, they're recommending three months postpartum for more higher impact activities. Um, and that includes running, any kind of running and jumping type activities um, and indicating that most changes with the pelvic floor occurs within the six months. Uh, so improving that healing and that strengthening um, and not having as widened of that uh, levator hiatus area. Uh, but that can persist up to a year. And then also can some things be uh, delayed with breastfeeding as far as the uh, pelvic floor healing. So it's a, a clinical question that's still being answered as far as when to return to sport or high level activities. Uh, so for the most part, we're wanting people to start gentle activities to keep themselves active and, and help with some of um, the issues that can happen postpartum. Um, but as far as before returning to a exercise regimen, we like to see them to, to make sure they don't have any of those abnormal symptoms as far as heaviness and fullness and uh, leakage of any kind. Okay. So, it, okay, I was like, oh, Lisa, is that you for breastfeeding? No, uh, <laughs> so just a quick last couple of topics that I like to touch on again to make sure that we are covering all our bases and assessing uh, the patient uh, sort of from the whole body aspect before we really are talking about return to activity. And one of these major areas uh, is breastfeeding for those who are choosing to breastfeed, which is a recommended activity for up to two years or beyond um, as desired by the patient. Um, so a couple of questions that come up for patients in this realm is how does that affect um, my training? How does training affect my breastfeeding relationship? Um, and essentially there's a lot of worries out there that I just tried to put to rest. Uh, as we know so far there's no effect of exercise on your milk supply as long as you're feeding or pumping on a, on a regular schedule. There are even case reports of increased milk supply with increased training. Um, we also know that there's no effect of training on your milk quality. There were some older studies that uh, mentioned lactic acid and does this affect the taste or the quality and essentially no, babies will feed um, 
when babies need to feed and this is not a concern or it's a concern that I tried to put to rest for most moms. There are a lot of barriers though. We do know that this is an added sort of burden for lack of better words on on a mother's day and and their time so certainly some of these barriers that we've seen and there is some research on this even with elite athletes um, the biggest barriers to success a successful relationship with physical activity and breastfeeding include the timing the amount of time that it takes uh, sleep nutrition again uh, the, the patient support system and uh, really their perceived relationship, kind of what their expectations are coming in, what they think is going to happen uh, when they train more or harder and breastfeeding. And I really try to um, get at that first of what they have, what their understanding is coming in so we can sort of try to uh, undo some of those um, unnecessary worries if we can. I do have a set of practical tips for patients that I like to share um, just for uh, making things more comfortable or more convenient with breastfeeding and training. And so number one, always feeding or pumping just prior to activity for comfort. Um, being aware of the timing and the type of your clothing, we do know that obviously patients are in need of a more supportive bra during this time. And it might need to be fairly constrictive and that amount of constriction actually does have an effect on breast milk supply if it's left in place for too long. Compression of the breasts can offer negative feedback and decrease the breast milk supply and so we recommend to put the uh, compressive clothing on just prior to exercise and taking it off as soon as possible after to avoid any negative effects there. Um, other more convenient tips are really just about milk and comfort storage. Um, these things, fresh milk can be left out for up to eight hours and so similar to freshly pumped or freshly used pump parts can be stored in a plastic or wet bag up to eight hours at a time. If it's any longer than that you'd want to refrigerate it. Um, but that really, you know, it, it alleviates some of the concerns of needing to wash or, or um, deal with all of these parts on a regular basis. So they really can go almost a full work day or so. And then of course, for any troubleshooting or general guidance, I always recommend people are working with a breastfeeding specialist or lactation consultant. So um, the last big category after kind of taking all of these things into account um, before we really get back into activity is assessing a patient's bone health at large and will their bones be ready to sort of take on this increasing amount of load over time that they're wanting to do. So a bone health, a comprehensive bone health evaluation includes a lot of these things listed here, um, their breastfeeding history, sort of their current breastfeeding practices, but also their lifetime breastfeeding history, how many children they've had how long they have um, breastfed each of those children for, um, any significant weight changes that they've gone through, if they have lost a lot of weight uh, postpartum inadvertently or intentionally, um, pregnancy history, history of stress fractures or other injuries, the history of their menstrual cycles prior to getting pregnant, uh, any medication use, specifically chronic steroid use for any other reason, history of uh, oral contraceptive pills prior to pregnancy. And then um, the evaluation after obtaining a lot of this history is multifactorial, it potentially includes some labs, vitamin D levels, things like that. But one of the things that I do get more frequently than other specialties out there, I feel is a DEXA scan, sort of an evaluation of where the bone mineral density is um, at that time. Not that it necessarily changes any of the treatment paradigms that we've already discussed, but it sort of can give us a sense of where that patient's bones are at that time and maybe what they will be able to tolerate from a, a, at least an acute training load standpoint. This is a chart that I use mostly to show patients sort of how I think about these things. This actually comes from the literature related to female athlete triad. Um, comes, with, comes from the 2004 consensus statement on the female athlete triad. 
but I find it very useful in other arenas such as this as well. And so it just sort of lists some of the risk factors. Obviously, some of these are not, or, or they need to be adapted when talking about the postpartum patient. But um, these are the things that we know that significantly will increase your risk for, um, for bone health and a risk of a bony stress injury when increasing your, your activity. So uh, it really comes down to energy availability, weight changes, uh, their menstrual history. Obviously, all uh, women have been recently amenorrheic, um, but we kind of talk about their history prior to that if they know what their bone mineral density is, and then again, their stress fracture history. And you can see how they're sort of categorized into low, moderate, and high risk here. So once we sort of get through all of this evaluation, we take all of these uh, factors into account, all of these different evaluations into account, and then we can sort of sit down and see where that patient is at that time, what things we need to maybe optimize before we are really talking about return program, and if they're ready, then we can talk about return. So some of the things, you know, obviously first step, determ just determining their readiness for activity, again, going through some of these prior evaluations, number one, making sure that they've been cleared from their OB, uh, but then sort of from a functional standpoint, making sure that they're pain-free with activities of daily living, walking, just getting around the house and doing what they need to do to take care of themselves and baby. Um, and then general principles of, of training include making sure that they have symmetric strength side to side and full range of motion in all of their extremities. Um, with running activity specifically, if that's the activity of choice that people are trying to get back to, um, we also want to include you know, a more specific lower extremity strength assessment and then kind of move to a walk to one run progression. And then finally, a continuous running program. So it's gradual and um, again, more function based. So that um, is sort of the end of the things here. If anybody has any questions or comments. Our pelvic floor exercise a standard recommendation for women who have just given birth, especially if they want to return to um, any kind of athletics or physical activity. Are you asking what the um, recommendation is? No, is it is it part of uh, postpartum care that those um, pelvic floor exercises are recommended, or should they come see you? Uh, typically, I believe they are recommended um, from their OB, but. As far as uh, pelvic floor exercises, about a third of people are doing them wrong, we find. And then um, a lot of individuals are uncertain if they're doing them correctly, uh, even if they are doing them correctly as well. So it just can increase some of their confidence. Um, and then also to give a more exact prescription because I believe the general recommendation is about 10 seconds, 10 times. Uh, a 10 second hold, 10 repetitions at a time, but a lot of individuals can't uh, hold that long. So we can assess where they're at and progress them from there too. I'll vouch for that. I did exercises incorrectly for about a month <laughs> before I was corrected. <laughs> Probably did myself a lot of harm. Or at least not help. Right? Didn't help, definitely didn't help, nope. <laughs> And Dr. Woodruff, at what point in postpartum care should a female athlete be referred to you, or what are the top three reasons that they would be referred to you? I think um, the best time would be when their uh, healthcare provider feels that they are medically ready and they're kind of in their office and say, okay, you know, this is your 15 minute postpartum check, and then the patient brings up by the way, they, uh, you know, I wanted to get back into such and such program, or I was thinking about signing up for CrossFit, or I wanted to do this. Well, how do you feel about that? Am I ready? And that can be a really long discussion, obviously. And so I think if the OB feels that they are medically cleared from their standpoint, I think that would be a great time to say, you know what, there's kind of a lot that goes into that discussion. Um, 
I have a perfect place <laughs> that you can kind of get a further evaluation that can help you get back into some of those activities that you prefer. Um, so I think really as long as there are no medical contraindications and, and the patient is looking for this, is, is asking for it, you know, we don't want to, again, push anybody faster or, or slower than they want to go. Um, so if this is something the patient is interested in and there are no uh, medical contraindications, I think they could be sent anytime. Okay. And there's a lot of um, research and talk about how exercise affects depression. Is there much literature on exercise as treatment or prevention for postpartum depression? That's a very good question. Uh, there is limited. I think it's sort of lumped into the uh, general population and, and depression treatment at large. Um, so there is some there, but there are not as many studies out there that specifically look at this population. Thank you. Are there any other questions or any of the team that just presented. Well, if other questions do come up, you can always feel free to reach out to any of the provider relations team. Um, we will be following up with everybody on the call and um, posting this to the referring providers page. And you can also reach out directly um, to Dr. Woodruff or um, Natalie Cruz or Becca Mellon as well, if it's relating to nutrition or pelvic floor physical therapy. So um, we can connect you with them as well. So um, if there are no other questions, we will let everybody go. We did want to remind you that we did record this and we'll be sending out the link to the recording as well as posting it. But we thank you for attending today's presentation, Postpartum Return to Fiscal Activity. And uh, like I said, if anything comes up, feel free to reach out to us. So other than that, have a fantastic day.